It's been said that humans use only 10% of their brains. Well, that is not entirely correct. It is more likely that we only understand 10% of the brain. The human brain remains one of the most mysterious parts of the body and one of the most intense objects of research. Its complexity is one of the reasons humans adapt so brilliantly to different conditions and why we humans are so powerful. But there is so much more about the brain that continues to confuse and intimidate our most brilliant researchers. In this video, we'll discuss five aspects of the brain that continue to surprise and confuse us. So as always, sit back and enjoy. Rose hip neurons. In 2018, an exciting new announcement was made about a previously undiscovered cell in the human brain. The new cell was named the rose hip neuron because of its likeness in shape to the fruit of rose bushes. The discovery of these new brain cells was first noticed a few years previous in two separate labs, one in Hungary and one in Seattle. And when they realized they were both investigating the same neuron, they decided to collaborate on a study. Using two brains donated to science from deceased men in their mid fifties, the labs used various techniques to study the neurons. The Hungarian team examined the neurons shape and electrical properties, while the Seattle team looked at the genetics. They found that these new neurons are different from other neurons. They are very dense and the dendrites are very compact with lots of branch points. Interestingly, this type of neuron only exists in humans, which probably explains why it took so long to discover them. As usually, animals, in particular rodents, are used in neuroscience studies. The existence of the rose hip neuron may explain why so many treatments for brain disorders seem to work in mouse models, but fail to be effective when applied to humans. Meaning these newly discovered neurons may hold the key to understanding complex psychiatric disorders in humans that do not exist in animals. Although for now, what the rose hip neuron does is not entirely clear. What we do know is that the cells make up about 10% of the neocortex, which was the last part of the brain to evolve and is associated with sight and hearing. It also appears to be an inhibitory neuron, meaning it regulates the flow of information to certain parts of the brain. It's hoped that further studies on brain samples from people suffering from neuropsychiatric disorders will show that they have altered rose hip neurons if this is the case, it may be possible to develop a targeted therapy to help those suffering. But for now, just like all the other mysterious parts of the brain we'll cover, their true function and significance is not known. Endorestiform nucleus. Now this next one is another exciting new discovery. Similar to rose hip neurons, again, it was not detected during animal experimentation and appears to be unique to the human brain. It's called endorestiform nucleus and is a nucleus present within the inferior cerebellar panuncle of human brains. It was discovered by George Paxinos and his team at Neuroscience Research Australia. George had long suspected the existence of the endorestiform nucleus However, it was not until 2018 that he was able to confirm its presence due to advances in staining and imaging techniques. The nucleus is located at the base of the brain, near where the brain meets the spinal cord. This area is involved in receiving sensory and motor information to refine our posture, balance, and movements. George explained that the inferior cerebellar panuncle is like a river carrying information from the spinal cord and brainstem to the cerebellum and the endorestiform nucleus is a group of neurons and is like an island in this river. He also said it was too early to know its true significance. Although it's possible the endorestiform nucleus has been hiding in plain sight for years. In a procedure called a therapeutic antilateral chordotomy, a surgery to achieve relief from extreme and incurable pain by cutting spinal pathways. George and his colleagues had noticed that the long fibers from the spine seemed to end around where the endorestiform nucleus was found. And the location of this elusive brain bit leads George to suspect it may be involved in fine motor control. 
His theory is backed up by the fact that this structure has yet to be identified in test animals, such as marmosets or monkeys, and may explain why humans have the dexterity to play instruments and perform intricate operations, whereas chimpanzees do not. Indicating the end restiform nucleus may be another unique feature in a human's nervous system. In order to discover what function the endo restiform nucleus might serve, we may have to wait for higher resolution MRIs capable of studying it in a living person. Comparing the normal brain studies for the atlas with those from people with known abnormalities might also lead to some insights. At the moment, it's impossible to know what implications this discovery of endorestiform nucleus have for neurological or psychiatric disease in the future, but investigations into the functionality of this nucleus in the coming years will be key in answering these questions. The posterior cingulate cortex. This part of the brain is one of the least well understood regions of the cortex. The posterior cingulate cortex, or PCC for short, is known as the dark energy of the brain as it consumes more calories than any other part of the brain, indicating it works very hard. However, no one is quite sure what it does. Even trying to study PCC is challenging because it does not function well as a test subject. For example, if you put a person into a brain scanner and ask them to do a task, any task, the PCC turns off. That is, its neurons stop firing. Then, during the delay between tasks, it turns on again, only to turn off again when the task restarts. It is also a part of the brain that is rarely targeted by diseases, like strokes, that create lesions, so it's hard to guess what happens when a PCC is compromised or damaged. It is, however, thought PCC is linked to emotions, memory, consciousness, attentional control, planning, and retrospection, although others have suggested that it governs mind-wandering or daydreaming, meaning it becomes active and consumes large amounts of energy when we are awake, but not really focused on anything in particular. However, it has shown abnormalities in connection with Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, and depression which may suggest it plays a vital role in focusing attention and arousal. But all these are just theories, and in reality, neuroscientists cannot conclusively say what this elusive energy-consuming part of our brain is really there for. The Mystery of Memories Our brain is like a computer's hard drive. It continually records information and stores it. And that is what forms our memories. So, whether it's the first time you saw your mother's face, your favorite holiday, or the time you realize you've fallen in love, it is all safely stored somewhere inside that incredible lump of jelly in your skull. And what is remarkable about our memories is it's not just a single snapshot, it's everything that goes with it, such as smells, colors, the way you felt, or even the weather on that particular day. However, neuroscientists have no idea how our brains do this, nor do they know how this information gets stored in the brain. There isn't just one kind of memory. We have both short-term and long-term memory, as well as declarative memories, responsible for names and facts, non-declarative memory, responsible for so-called muscle memory or flashbulb memories, when we can recall precise details of an event. And the brain has the ability to recognize and categorize the importance of some of these memories, for example, the more some information is repeated or used, the more likely it is to be retained in long-term memory, which is why the more studying you do, the better you generally do in tests. Neuroscientists think that where these memories are stored depends on the original experience. For instance, groups of neurons in the visual cortex store the visual memory, whereas neurons in the amygdala store the associated emotion. It's also believed that no memory is ever wiped out completely. It will be in the brain somewhere, although retrieving it, especially after an illness, brain injury, or the lapse of time, is sometimes impossible. It is impressive that neuroscientists have been able to tell us all about memories. However, there is still a lot they aren't sure about, like how memories form, why certain memories degrade and fade, why we sometimes develop fake memories, and why we cannot always recall information when we need it. 
And like so many other mysteries of the brain, it could be some years before we fully understand how we make and keep memories. Human Consciousness What is consciousness? Is it located in the brain? Is it a physical thing? Is it unique to humans? Or could every physical thing have a conscience? Or is there some other explanation for it? Well, despite these appearing to be relatively straightforward questions, it seems that even the most brilliant scientists in the world are no nearer to answering any of them, and human consciousness still remains a mystery. It does seem hard to believe that a three pound lump of jelly-like moist pinkish beige tissue inside our skulls can possibly be responsible for our awareness. Thought process, feelings, and memories, all individually tailored to every single human being that has ever existed, but without any other explanation, that is what many believe. Of course, that wasn't always the case. Early Christian philosophers believed the soul of a human was created by God and infused into the body at conception, and that it lived on even after the physical body dies and the soul of a person was responsible for all the things we now recognize as consciousness. However, scientists have long dismissed this argument and over the years, they have learned an astonishing amount about our brains and are able to pinpoint which regions of the brain are associated with most things, that is, apart from consciousness. So is it possible consciousness is not a physical thing, it is not controlled by our brains and does not reside in our bodies? Well, if this is the case, then it opens up the possibility that every living and non-living thing has a conscience of some degree that is unique to them. For instance, if we believe our pets have consciousness, albeit a bit different to humans, in principle, that could mean that trees, plants, the internet, a smartphone, or even a TV could also have a form of consciousness unique to them. In fact, everything in the universe might be conscious, or at least potentially conscious, or conscious when put into certain configurations. The thing is, we do not know because it cannot be observed except from within by the conscious person or thing. It cannot even really be described and only the person or thing knows what it feels like to them. At any given moment, no matter how well you know someone, you haven't got a clue if their inner consciousness is the same as yours. So could consciousness somehow be something extra, an additional ingredient in nature, unique to everything and everyone? that has nothing to do with ordinary physical atoms? Could scientists in the future create robots that are so human-like you wouldn't be able to tell whether they were human or not unless they were put through a scanner? But just because they have no physical human organs, does that also mean they would have no consciousness? Or would they have their own unique consciousness? So should we concede without any evidence that consciousness is just the physical brain doing what brains do? and eventually neuroscience will prove this. Well, at the moment, the closest thing they have got to proving this is when a team of researchers designed a device that stimulates the brain with electrical voltage to measure how integrated its neural circuits are. The device was tested on a variety of subjects and revealed when people fall into a deep sleep or are anaesthetized as they slip into unconsciousness. The device demonstrates that their brain integration declines and amongst patients suffering from locked-in syndrome, who are as conscious as the rest of us, levels of brain integration remain high, but among patients who are in coma, it doesn't. These tests seem to indicate the brain is in part responsible for consciousness. However, this theory is again thrown into doubt with near-death experiences. When people repeatedly claim during near-death experiences, they recall leaving their physical bodies, but are still able to recall details of hospital staff relatives and medical procedures, implying that consciousness may not always reside within the body. So, although scientists may believe they are getting closer to finding out what the brain does for human consciousness, there are still many unanswered questions and anomalies they cannot explain. So it's safe to say that for now, at least human consciousness is still a mystery.